Welcome to the 2014 Dr. Martin Luther King Commemorative Address. I'm Karen Tokars, a member of the faculty and coordinator of the Public Interest Law and Policy Speaker Series. Today we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. King, one of the country's most heroic champions of racial justice and equality. Today we also celebrate another great champion for justice and equality, Justice Bernice Donald from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And today we also celebrate the School of Law. I've been working with Chloe Woods, Isatu Berry, and other BALSA members to explore the history of African Americans and the history of BALSA here at the law school. This year marks the 125th anniversary of the admission of the first African American to the School of Law, Walter Moran Farmer, in fall of 1889. This year, we think, marks the 40th anniversary of the founding of the BALSA chapter here at the law school. This year, we think, marks the 25th anniversary of the law school Dr. Martin Luther King commemorative address. And this year, we know, marks the 10th anniversary of the BALSA annual BALSA dinner, at which Judge Donald will be the keynote speaker this Saturday evening. As is our tradition, here to introduce Judge Donald is this year's BALSA president and advocate for justice and equality in her own right, Ginny Warfork. Good morning. Um, thank you for coming. Today we celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Like Dr. King, today's speaker, Judge Bernice B. Donald, is a trailblazer, a hero, a role model for women, people of color, and all Americans who care about justice and equality under the law. Dr. King once said, law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice, and when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. Dr. Ju <laughs> Judge Donald has dedicated her entire career to upholding the law while promoting justice and progress. As an African American and as a woman, I am honored and honored and privileged to introduce Judge Donald. Judge Donald received her JD from the University of Memphis. After graduating, she began a career dedicated to public service. She worked at Memphis Area Legal Services until she was elected to the General Sessions Criminal Court of Memphis in 1982. She was the first African American female judge in the history of Tennessee. In 1988, she was appointed to the U.S. Bankruptcy Court, becoming the first female in the history of the country to serve as a U.S. Bankruptcy Judge. In 1995, President Clinton nominated Judge Donald to serve on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Tennessee. In 2010, President Obama nominated Judge Donald to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. She was the first African-American female judge in the country to hold that position. Currently, Judge Donald serves as the president of the American Bar Foundation. As president, she travels extensively through the country, promoting the foundation's mission of advancing justice through research and law. Judge Donald is the first African-American and the second female to lead the foundation. Today, more than ever, I need, we need, and our country needs trailblazers, heroes, and role models like Judge Donald. Please join me in welcoming her to Washington University School of Law. Thank you so much. Let me say what an honor it is to be here at Washington University. My visit has been warm, inspiring, engaging, and it is so good to see so many friends here. Uh, when I look at the list of people who come to give this address, I am truly awed uh, to have been invited to be among the, the list of speakers uh, to uh, speak to you on this occasion. I want to first acknowledge and thank the Dean. Uh, I want to thank uh, Karen and uh, uh, Susan Appleton for their energies and organizational skills in getting me here. Uh, the members of the bar who are here, I certainly thank you. I would note uh, Bill Bay, the former uh, president of the litigation section of the American Bar Association, Mari Posco, the former uh, chair of the section of business law of the American Bar Association and members of their respective firms. And I'm truly awed and honored to have my friend, the president, former president of the National Bar Association and the, uh, the 
uh, collector, t is a tax collector, uh, and her counsel, Ms. Mavis Thompson. Please stand and, and just thank you so much for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. Thank you so much. And I see author um, Karen, is it Norwood? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, back there. I was at her um, book deal yesterday, and it was so interesting uh, to hear the discussion about colorism. Uh, I have been invited to talk about a couple things, and I'm going to do that. Uh, you know, I want to just start off by saying <clears throat> there are so many bright young people in this room who probably are here at this lecture, and uh, we're going to be talking about things from an era gone by, well before you were ever uh, conceived of. Um, when you think about it, uh, and, and we think, oh, these, this is ancient history, think about it. The first email was sent in 1971. These young people cannot envision a time when they didn't have email or cell phones. It's just inconceivable. And I'm going to be talking to you about times of exclusion. And so, you know, we say in the Baptist Church, sometimes you just have to be placed in the moment. And for you, not the dean, not the professors, for you, the students, I need to get you placed in the moment. For the Balsa president, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for the kind things, and thank you all for supporting these events. Allow me to put you in the moment to have you see what the laws and things that you're studying and talk about tried and have, tr have tried and did remedy to some degree. I'm going to ask you to bear with me while you watch images from the Civil Rights Movement, images of the things that Dr. King dedicated his life to try and eradicate. Roll the tape, please.
believe that all men are created equal, yet many are denied equal freedom. We believe that all men have certain unalienable rights, yet many Americans do not enjoy those rights. We believe that all men are entitled to the blessings of liberty. Yet millions are being deprived of those blessings, not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. The reasons are deeply embedded in history and tradition and the nature of man. We can understand without rancor or hatred how this all happened, but it cannot continue. Our Constitution, the foundation of our Republic, forbids it. The principles of our freedom, forbid it. Morality, forbids it. And the law I will sign tonight, forbids it. the struggle for equality in the United States is one that doesn't track a straight line. 
It has always been a struggle, and it continues today to be a struggle. The players are more diverse, the issues are more numerous, but the struggle exists today. And there are many perspectives on uh, what this country's ultimate goal is for achieving uh, the equality, the equal opportunity that our founding documents extol. But the decision ultimately is one that is in our hands. I said yesterday, and the message that I have for you today is that we have wonderful laws, but laws are not self-executing. We had wonderful laws that spoke to and extol equality in all of its forms. At the same time, all of those violent images that you just witnessed were being perpetrated, being performed, being acted out in these United States. Yet, those acts were necessary to try and move a country toward the goal of matching the ideals extolled in the founding documents. We have still not achieved that ideal. Uh, notwithstanding the eloquence of those founding documents, we still are plagued, we still suffer from some of the scars that were visited upon this country based on the effects of slavery, inequality, injustice, oppression, and our legacy is a legacy of struggle. Think about just a couple of things, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to go into this. We had a civil war that was fought. And there can be debate, reasonable and unreasonable, about why that war was fought. There can be no doubt about the outcome. And then we had the court's involvement. Courts have been protectors of the rights and freedoms of equality, but courts have also sanctioned inequality. Think about the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford in 1857, where the court said, where an African American who was born in a slave state ultimately made his way to a free state and sought to sue for his freedom, and the court said, but African Americans are not citizens and cannot be citizens, and hence they cannot have standing to sue in federal courts. Move forward to Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 where the court said, even though educational institutions were clearly segregated, and I say clearly not equal, but because there were uh, universities and schools rather for African Americans, the court said, as long as there are separate facilities, separate but equal is okay. It's the law of the land. Uh, and we don't have to have uh, integration uh, where people were able to sit on the back of boxcars as long as they were able to, to take advantage of public transportation. The Plessy Doctrine said that's okay. Well, ultimately in 1954, the court decided the Brown versus the Board of Education case and declared then that separate but unequal is inherently unequal. Recognizing, of course, what I think had been patently uh, obvious to those who were living under those conditions, that separate but um, equal can never really be equal. Uh, you know, talking about the law uh, and, 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 and whether or not laws are self-fulfilling, I look at my own situation. I will say to you, and I don't want you to do the math, but when the first Brown cases were filed in district courts, uh, I was unborn. At the time the Brown decision in 1954 came down, I was three years old. But when I started to school in Olive Branch, Mississippi, I started school in a two-room cinder block school that had first and second grades in room one. It was a two-room school. And the third grade was in a separate room. And the older kids, because the school in our community for the African Americans only went to the eighth grade, they went to school uh, up the hill at the black church.
And under the law at that time, because there was a facility for African American kids, that was okay. That was equal. For most of my school years, every book that I got in school came to me already with a bunch of names in it of people that I didn't know. There were names in it like Emily and Heather and Tom, people who were unknown to me. But those were the books that we got, and sometimes those books came to the black schools after they had already been discontinued at the other schools. But that was sanctioned because it was until Brown, the law of the land. But even after Brown, even after the highest court in the land spoke, Mississippi, a sovereign state, said, we will not desegregate, we will not integrate our schools. It is not until the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and the Voting Rights Act, when the federal government said to Mississippi, unless you desegregate, you will get no more money for public education. It is only then, in 1965-66, that school year, that Mississippi decided that they would implement a choice plan and allow those students who wanted to go uh, to the formerly all-white schools to go. And so, in 1967, uh, Mississippi then integrated or desegregated its high schools. And I, along with three other African-American women, left the sanctity and safety of our school and went to the white school. And it was, a, it was an incredible experience. Uh, you could see the difference between the two institutions. My comment is not any negative comment on the teachers at my school. They were dedicated men and women who came to work every day to impart a quality education to the school students who were at that school. But they lacked some of the equipment, the tools, the money that was at the, uh, the corresponding white school that I ultimately transferred to. I was exposed to things that, that were not a part of my education at my other school. And so I had opportunities by virtue of my transfer that people at my old school didn't have. But with that, I lost a lot of the security of having a lot of people around me who looked and felt and respected who I was and what I stood for. I won't take you to talk time today to tell you about some of the things that I went through in that experience, but I will tell you that Mississippi, before we got to that ultimatum, in 1959, Mississippi decided to construct Plessy compliant schools for the black kids. You see, the school that I went to in, when I first started, I told you it was a two-room center block school. It had no running water, no indoor f plumbing facilities. It had basically nothing. It had no running water. The kids from the high school would bring water down in pails to the elementary school for the kids to drink. These are the kind of conditions that we're talking about. And when I tell you that it's like, for you, ancient history, that condition and those conditions existed when I entered school. And so it doesn't feel like such a long time to me. But those situations, Mississippi in 1959 built a wonderful school for the black kids in order to keep the established segregated facilities. Uh, but as I said, in 1965, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act uh, and some other uh, civil rights legislation, that whole system came to an end, and those who wanted to go were able to go to that school. You know, once going there, and, and, and this whole movement has never been about African Americans and white kids being able to sit side by side uh, in a facility. It's about equality of opportunity. It's about equal access. It's about um, those documents that I told you about up front. Sitting side by side, for me, uh, had some advantages because I was able to take advantage of things that my counterparts uh, took advantage of. But even though I sat in the room, for me, there was still visible discrimination. Let me tell you about two experiences. When I was at the black school, I was an honor student. And I didn't mean to make this so much about me today, but I, I have to tell you these stories. I was an honor student, so when I went to the white school, I decided I was supposed to be an honor student. And I worked very hard, 
Susan so that I could be on the Honor Society. And so my senior year, I became an honor student. And I was very proud of that fact. I was the only African American on the Honor Society. There were only four of us in the class. The principal of that school, whose name I'm not going to divulge, forbade the counselors of the school from giving any African American student any information about college. I'm one of 10 children. I'm number six from the top. I'm the first in my family to graduate high school and the first one to go to college. I had always wanted to go to college. As I sit here right now, I cannot tell you how I got there. I don't know how I got there. I don't know the process. And when I say, I, I'm not talking about effort. I'm not talking about abilities. I'm talking about the process. I don't know how I learned the steps to go through to get into college because no counselor gave me any information about college. I went to the University of Memphis. I enrolled. What I majored in is really not relevant, but I changed majors at some time. And I worked my way through college. I learned, after I became a judge in 1982, I learned that I had earned scholarships for college. But like the counselors could not give me any information about college, they were prohibited from giving me any information or notifying me that I had earned scholarships. And so, I worked my way through. Now fast forward, people say, that's a long time ago. You don't talk about that. That's in the past. It is in the past. But the past is prologue for the future. Example, I got a job at the telephone company and uh, my goal was to be a lawyer in their legal department. When I went for an interview, the interviewer said to me, you know, you didn't go to a very good law school, and you know, you went to night law school, and we hire from Ivy League schools. Had nothing to do with my ability, my talent, my placement in my class. I didn't go to a very good law school. And so, actions of the past, over which I had no control, but which were determined solely by skin color, the arbitrary color at birth influenced actions and decisions going forward. And so those things still affect the future. When we think about situations today, the issues of gender, the issues of race, the issues of religion, of age, and all of those things, all of those things are things over which we have no control. We don't control gender, race, but those decisions still influence actions and there are policies that are still being, uh, uh, today, uh, that are being promulgated that have at their core objectives that influence, drive societal decisions and choices that will define where people go ultimately they will determine life outcomes, they will determine life opportunities, and we will react to people based on many of those arbitrary attributes. Yesterday, when I was listening to the colorism choice, and I'm, I'm not up here to, pro to promote your book, but it certainly did sound interesting to me. Um, but the thing that, that that um, the author talked about, how even today, you know, there are issues that are based on race, but there are also those issues that are based on color. And kids who are coming in today, um, even intra-race, are dealing with issues of bias based on things of which they have no control, and maybe over things of which they don't even understand. Society today still, uh, at the macro level, uh, is influenced and driven by policies that are tied inextricably to color. When we look at those things that define who we are as a people, when we look at 
who we are as Americans. And we know, we say that we come from all shores, but when we think about the American, we think about the image of a certain individual, or we think about certain attributes that sort of define who Americans are. But Americans don't come in one size, one color. They don't come in you know, one eye color. They come in all kinds of eye colors, in all sizes and shapes. And in the courts, we are seeing decisions, outcomes, consequences of policies that relate to the kinds of things that, that I've talked about today. You know, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment provided the basis for constitutional protections against discrimination. But there's still a lot of types of discrimination that are out there. Some of them, there is no redress. We know it exists. But there simply is no redress. There are many that the courts are, face, are, are grappling with, and we're making decisions. But the courts can't solve the problem of racial discrimination. The courts can't solve the problem of inequality. Only people can solve those issues. Everyone in here has an obligation to stand up, to speak up, to speak out. You know, there's that TSA thing that says that if you, if you see something, say something. Well, the same with issues of discrimination, of racism, of intolerance. If you see something, say something, speak out. Not just about those things that affect you, but all of us have an obligation to create a society in which every individual can prosper and reach his or her full potential. You saw in the slides that I showed you, you saw struggle, you saw progress, you saw America at perhaps one, some of its, its lowest moments. When you saw troops with bayonets drawn on American citizens, people who sought nothing more than to access the rights that are fully set forth in founding documents, those things that speak to freedom. You saw people being beaten. You saw people who were killed for nothing more than seeking those things for which they are an heir. I would hope that this country never goes through an experience like that again. But only you can ensure that the country never goes through that again. Only you have the power to prevent that from happening. Everyone in here can do something. No one in here can do everything, but everyone can do something. And I wanted to show that because one of the things I hope you noticed was the age of so many of the actors in those images. They were students. Students have always been change agents because universities are laboratories of learning. Universities give people the ability to analyze, to think, to learn to respect different views, to learn to have the courage to speak up and speak out, but also to come to the aid of someone who doesn't look like you, doesn't think like you, but who stands for principles around which each of us can rally. Universities and students have always played key roles in movements for change. And it is students who will continue to play that role uh, as we, as we uh, move forward. I said that laws are not self-executing. Laws can't prevent injustice. Only people can prevent injustice. They can't pre uh, prevent discrimination. Only people can do that. And people have an obligation to do that very thing. I want to share with you one final story, and then I want to take a few questions and then share with you one other short uh, video. I told you that I graduated um, from my uh, high school and went on to law school, and I have been involved um, in a number of things that bring me uh, great joy and, and, and give me an opportunity to do uh, wonderful work. In terms of how I decided to come to the law, when I grew up in my community, the people around me, the role models, were teachers and preachers. 
I didn't know a lawyer growing up. I didn't really know a lawyer. I met three lawyers, but I didn't really know them. The way I met them, I grew up in Olive Branch, a town 20 miles south of Memphis, during a time when uh, the civil rights movement was in its heyday. And in our community, they were trying to desegregate public accommodations. Three young white lawyers, two from New York and one from California, came to the aid of the people of Olive Branch to help in the movement of getting people registered to vote and to help with the desegregation initiatives. They were outside agitators and they were not welcome in our community. So they could not um, stay in uh, the hotels there. They had to stay in people's homes. And those three stayed in our home. There were others who stayed in other homes. But those were the lawyers. And when I looked at those young people, I thought how brave they were to travel that far from home to come and help a people to whom they owed nothing. People that they didn't know. They risked their safety and their health to come that far south to help in a movement that really didn't have any immediate benefit for them. And I thought, these are young lawyers, how wonderful it would be to be a lawyer. But when I looked at them and I looked at me, I saw nothing in me that will enable me to do what they did. They were white and I was not. And I didn't know any lawyers. But I harbored this desire to one day become a lawyer. But then I put it out of my mind. I told you that they couldn't stay in hotels they had to stay in homes, and there were a couple of reasons they couldn't stay. One, they were outside agitators, and two, Olive Branch didn't have a hotel, so they couldn't stay there. Time passed, and eventually, I went off to law school, and ultimately, I became a lawyer. But I always thought about those three people. I thought about their personal risk, their sacrifice. And I have to believe that they knew that one cannot be free in an environment while others do not have at least the hope for freedom. You can't yourself stay up while holding someone down. And they knew that our laws, as long as they oppressed a people, could not in fact produce a free society. And they did what they could. I'm sure, Maura, that they were young lawyers from the American Bar Association, but I don't know that. But they were, in fact, young lawyers. That story has always meant a lot to me. And it's one of the things that has always motivated me to do everything and anything I can to try and make certain that I work to create an environment in which people can achieve their full potential. It is a marvelous time in which you live, in which I live. It's a time of challenge, but it's also a time of opportunity. And everyone here will need to find their place, find the thing that you can do that enables society to, be to become better, to become more equal, to become more inclusive, and to, come, to become one that honors and recognizes the dignity, the effort, and the energy of every individual here. If we don't do that, then we fail and we dishonor those rights that we take so much for granted. It's not free. All of us as citizens must pay a price, and that is to secure the freedom of others around. And I think that's what Dr. King would have us do today. It's not enough to know and understand the dream. Our obligation is to actualize the dream. And not just dream selfishly, but to dream the dream of freedom for each and every citizen, whether they are a new citizen or whether they, was, whether they were born here. I think that's what he would have us do. I think that's what that march uh, was about. It was about economic freedom, it's about social justice, and it's about upholding and extolling and fulfilling the promise of democracy and freedom to which each and every American is a rightful heir. I will take your questions at this time or comments.
Thank you. I know we stopped right at one because there's a class, but if there are no questions, I want to show you one other, if there is a question, I'll take it or a comment, but I want to show you one other short video, and I don't see a hand, so cue the video. This is a progress video, okay? questions, I'm happy to take them. I promised I wouldn't go over one o'clock, but, and we're here. Yes? Uh, the question was, what advice would I give law students who work, want to work in the civil rights area? And, you, you know, um, I, I would say, if you're in a community, in a school where you've got a, a clinic, um, Civil rights is more than, than just registering the vote, marching, things of that nature. One of the new uh, frontiers, and I know you all have had uh, Michelle Alexander here, but she talks about um, the, the, new, the new slavery, the new uh, Jim Crow. Uh, and she talks about the whole issue of, of, of the criminal justice system and of juveniles. If you think about it, uh, there are some children who are, and they're disproportionately black and brown, who are going to be, as juveniles, remanded to the adult system. They're going to be tried as adults. 
without ever getting the franchise to vote, they will be forever locked out because of, uh, of criminal adjudications. There are individuals who are frankly wrongfully convicted, not all, but there are many. Um, I think if you can work in a project where you have passion, that is a very meaningful thing to do. There are voter registration drives. There's, voter, there's serious voter education needed. We don't do civics in school anymore. If you can find places in the community to teach civics, to work with people, I think that is a, that is a real big help. I introduced, a, a, I called Bill Bay's name earlier. I just want to share with you, last year he put on three amazing programs. One of the programs that he uh, presented at one of his meetings was one where he introduced us to a young man who was wrongfully convicted and spent uh, a number of years, I mean a number of years, like more than a decade or so, uh, on death row for a crime he didn't commit. Uh, prosecutors had pretty good evidence that, that he probably didn't do it, suppressed that, I mean, it's horrible. He was eventually, because of the work of, I believe, a law professor or a teacher who got involved and ultimately helped him get habeas relief, and he was ex eventually exonerated and released. He spoke passionately, without bitterness, but he expressed a hopefulness in um, a system that would try to enact reforms that would prevent this from happening again, and encouraging people to step forward and help those who are pleading uh, for help. Young students at universities, whether they're law students or not, have been involved in the Innocence Project to try and uh, exonerate people. There are many things that you can do, uh, applying your talents, your skills, you know, fit in where you can. And I think all of those things are, are helpful. Um, and I, I know that there are many people who are looking for volunteers, so that would be one thing I would mention. Anything else? You've been a wonderful, patient audience. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Godspeed.